Ski Tracks project was kind of a, the first attempt, at least our first attempt, I should be clear, our first attempt to try and understand how we made decisions in real time in the backcountry. And as you might remember, what we were doing is getting you to GPS track yourself in the backcountry. And the idea was that if we could see where you were going, we would have a, a geographic expression of the sum of all your decisions, all right? I don't know who you are, I don't know how you made the decisions, but I know where you went, because you had the GPS on, right? That was the idea behind that. And then we coupled that with a survey that said, you know, how old are you, what experience have you got? And from that, we tried to pull out some information. Proud to say we collected over 5,000 tracks from around the world. Uh, we got a good number of tracks from here in uh, the Cascade area, so that was exciting. Thank you once again if you did uh, help out with that. And there's just a snapshot of some tracks on various different days. So some areas you've got lots and lots of tracks, the Tetons, no surprise there, lots of great skiing, lots of people getting after it. In other areas we've got much fewer tracks. And just in a nutshell, because I love to come back and talk to you about what we actually did with all that data, just in a nutshell, and I could give a, a two-hour soliloquy about this, so I'm going to keep it short, um, is that gender experience and avalanche education mattered in terms of the terrain you used and when you used it and how you used that terrain. So you might go, well, geez, Jordi, did you really need 5,000 tracks to work that out? Right? I could have probably told you that. So sometimes what I like to do is quantify what we already know. We think we know it. We have some basis for that understanding. But can we actually prove that? And in many of these cases, we can. The next part of the analysis is getting a little bit more of a refined or more nuanced understanding of those tracks. The analysis we've done to date has been kind of fairly simple. It's looked at slope angle, it's looked at aspect. And really where we need to go next is kind of a, a, a much more nuanced, much more detailed analysis, and we haven't got those results yet. So at some stage, I'll be able to present those. But the biggest challenge of this data set was that we could see who you were, at least if you participated, we could see who you were. We could also see um, where you went and under what hazard conditions you went out, but we didn't know why, all right? So it's fine to see, again, a little bit like some of these accident analyses when you look at the cause of death or an accident, you can see what happened, right? But if the person's died or if the person's not responsive towards your questions, you're still left with the why. So the why is kind of where we are now. So uh, a colleague of mine gave a presentation for me uh, in Norway, and at that conference, uh, a behavioral economist was sitting in the audience. And you might think, well, what's a behavioral economist doing sitting in a snow science conference? Well, it turns out that she's a really, really keen backcountry skier. When she's not sitting at a computer thinking about behavioral economics, she likes the backcountry ski. And she got caught in a really bad avalanche. And getting caught in a really bad avalanche that almost killed her got her thinking about what are the parallels around how we make decisions around cost and consequence, very similar to how behavioral economics thinks, in the avalanche world. And that was the nucleus of what became the White Heat Project. So Andrea Manberg, uh, my colleague at UIT in Tromso, contacted me. Uh, this was before we were collaborators. And you know, she sent me an email, and I had a look through the email, and I was like, huh, that's a really interesting way to think about this problem. You know, behavioral economists are really good, typically, at selling us stuff, all right? They know how our brain ticks so that we go, oh, wow, maybe I will have soup for dinner tonight. I never thought of that. Well, no, you didn't, because they thought of it so that you bought it, right? So that's part of what behavioral economics do, all right? So maybe, just maybe, we can use that idea where, huh, yeah, let's go ski this track. Yeah, that sounds great. Do you want to ski it? Yeah. Do you want to go first? Oh, no, I want to go first. All right, so why is that happening, all right? I can't answer that, I'm a snow scientist. So what's really cool about this is working with someone from a different background allows you to explore the same problem through a different lens. And what I found out very, very quickly is that these people are really smart, really smart, all right? They like to ski, but they're also really clever. So we can use some of their, some of their paradigms, some of their theories to apply it to our world. Let's not say we're not clever, they've just been thinking about some of this stuff for a lot longer. So the home of the project is a new uh, uh, collaborative space that's called the Center for Avalanche Research and Education Care at UIT in Tromso. I was fortunate to spend three months over there this summer, and it was just fantastic to get some face-to-face -face time and work through some of these issues. And the main aim of the White Heat Project is to generate new and usable knowledge on excessive risk-taking behavior in general 
and on factors behind decision errors in avalanche terrain in particular. So their, their secondary goal is called a net zero. They want to see zero avalanche fatalities from recreational activities. So I think that's a really great goal, and I'm really proud to be part of this group working to try and achieve that goal. So a diverse, multifaceted problem with snow, with terrain, with uncertainty, with decision making, with psychology, requires a diverse team. And I'm really proud to say that we're working with some fantastic people. So we have, as I said already, Andrea, she's the lead of this project. Uh, she's a behavioral economist. Her previous work was based on sexual risk-taking behavior, all right? So there's some parallels, all right? So <laughs> we'll talk about the second part of that talk, the powder arousal, but there is actually some parallels, and I'll get you to think about what some of those might be. So that's Andrea, that's, that's where she prefers to be. Myself, coming in as a snow scientist, I think when you, when you engage in some of these questions, you want it grounded in the science that you're asking the questions about. So it's great to know about decision making, it's fantastic to know about how the human mind works, but if it's just about that, then you're not gonna answer it relative to snow and avalanches. So that's where my role is there, to try and bring that snow and avalanche side to the decision making space. Alden Hetland, psychologist. Psychologists are fantastic to work with, uh, very fun to uh, drink beer with, always have a good story. Um, Alden's PhD looked at risk-taking behavior in base jumpers. So, okay, fairly risky, but you start seeing the ways they weigh up the risk and how they think about the risk and how they process that risk as well. And then our fourth component to that is Jerry Johnson, political scientist at MSU. Uh, again, you might think, what's a political scientist doing on a project like this? Well, he's thought a lot about land use, he's thought a lot about management, and he's thought about outcomes. How do you take science and actually digest that and interpret that in a way that people can make sense of it? So, that's enough about the team. What are we doing? So, one of the things that we've done is we've been using this tool called Hypothetical Choices to look at individual risk. Did anyone see a survey like this about two years ago uh, we distribute it through Airy. Yep, a couple of hands up, great. So Airy helped us out to send this out. Uh, we also sent it out through a number of the Avalanche forecasting uh, pages. And what we were really interested in doing was asking people what they would, uh, we asked them a whole series of demographic questions and we asked them some questions about risk profile and so on. But then we fundamentally said, you've come up to this position, you've toured up this, this backside of a hill, and now you're presented with these four options to ski. I mean, pretty awesome mountain that you've got four, four lines like that, right? So it's a hypothetical situation. So you've got four hypothetical choices of what you would ski with your group. And we asked people what they would prefer to ski, and then we also asked them what they would accept to ski if their buddies said that they wanted to go and ski it. So what we're trying to measure is what is your preference, what would you like to do, versus what would you maybe be willing to do under certain peer pressure situations, all right? And we, we think about that as kind of your, your, your risk plasticity. So how tolerant are you towards increasing or changing your risk profile as a function of who's around you? So we looked at prefer versus accept, and we asked about demographics and recreation and so on, and we got about 467 responses. So from an online survey that took about 25 minutes, we we're pretty happy with, with that sort of level of response. Um, that work's now being published, but in short, we, want to, we basically want to tell you that the attitudes and perceptions of risk predict hypothetical choices. So your, how risky you think something is, is important in terms of what you choose, all right? So again, not rocket science. If you think something's riskier, it's, it probably is. So there's a connection there with what you think. But the other piece of that that I think is much more interesting than that is that social admiration is also important in terms of decisions related to the avalanche risk. So if you wanted to be parts of a group, if you aspired to be skiing with people that you thought were more interesting, uh, more hardcore, more capable, you might be more willing to accept that higher level of risk, that kind of keeping up with other people in that group. Riders accept a ski terrain that is riskier than their preferred run, so most people had some level of plasticity, were willing to take on a little bit more than themselves. So this goes back to how did you make that decision? How tolerant would you be to everybody else going down this way, or would you just turn around and go back down the skin track? So trying to understand what's driving that. 
And then most interestingly, neither experience nor travel skills predict the acceptance to a, to a risky tri uh, ski run. So it's not just that people were really good skiers and wanted to ski the steeper run, there was no, no connection there with ability. So what that tells us is that that peer group, that esteem around who you're with, can be really important in terms of that difference between perception and risk, and, and, and actually what you end up doing. So there's a paper on the White Heat page, if you go to the white, whiteheat.com, whiteheatproject.com, uh, you'll find one of those papers on there. Uh, so feel free to take a closer look at that. All right, the next one that we worked on is something called positional preferences. All right, anyone want to give me a guess as to what that is? It's a family show. I any thoughts? All right, it's not that. So positional preferences is if an individual is positional, i.e. they have positional preferences, he, she not only cares about their absolute level of consumption, of various goods and activities, but also cares about this level compares to others, all right? The simple way of saying it is it's that kind of keeping up with the Joneses is what we think of. And it's very much an economic kind of paradigm, this idea that you've got a perfectly good vehicle, maybe you've just gone and scored the best van that you've ever had, right? You can go ski, you can sleep in it. Who's got one of these? A few of you? All right, good, you're happy with it, right? Perfectly happy with it. Yeah, you just think it's fantastic. And then your neighbor or your buddy who you always ski with turns up with this thing. <laughs> and you're just like, what? I just got my van, it was fine, right? So the van hasn't changed its value. But relatively speaking, all of a sudden you're like, oh, can we go in your car? Let's go in your vehicle, all right? So people that care about this are people that are positional. And what the literature shows from the economics world is that people are positional about material goods. Things like cars matter, things like houses matter, right? This is that whole uh, you know, consumerism, right? That, what is it, two-thirds of this economy is based on, right? So positionality matters. So the question we had is, does positionality matter in a leisure activity, i.e. backcountry skiing? And we're interested in this because backcountry skiing allows us to look at more than just $5 here, $5 there, what is the difference between this, or $100 here or there, from an economics perspective, we can look at either end of that continuum. We can look at life or death decisions, all right? That's the consequences when things go wrong. So what does positionality do for us, all right? So this stems from our need to be accepted member in a social group that's important to us, it makes us want to be good enough in the eyes of others. If we do, we feel good. If we don't, maybe we feel bad. And not everybody feels this, but a portion of the population does, and are problematic from an economic standpoint because they create an arms race. People are racing to be better than the other, and that then ultimately leads to a waste of resources. All right, so who, who has an Instagram page? All right, who has a Facebook page? All right, keep, keep your hands up if you've got either of those. Keep your hand up if you've ever posted a rad ski line on there that you've skied. Uh, quite a few of us, all right? Okay, so we don't need to look too far, start seeing that maybe this is happening in our world, all right? So the people are proud of what they're doing. So the next question is, does it matter? Does it influence you or I's behavior? So that was what we wanted to look at. So what we did is we set up this scenario. And again, this is a hypothetical choice scenario. We said, imagine a weekend where you've been out riding, you rode terrain that you judged to be safe, and responsible given the avalanche conditions and your riding and your riding and train management skills. So you're happy with the line, perfectly happy, all right? Snow conditions are good. Now imagine that you learned afterwards about the riding of others had in your social group that weekend. How would you experience your level of satisfaction with your weekend be affected by the following situations? Presume that no accidents occurred. You rode much more challenging terrain than others, Others rode more challenging terrain than you, all right? We defined people that were positional that scored high on the top one and low on the other. So if they, if they felt better, because they'd done better than all of you guys, and they felt worse if you guys had skied better stuff than them, all right? If you ticked on those boxes either end of that scale, we called you a positional skier or rider, all right? That was our definition for positionality in this particular case. 
little bit of participant uh, um, engagement here because you guys just had lunch and you've got a big belly full of food. Who thinks they're positional? Honestly, come on. Hands up. All right, interesting. So from our data, we saw that a positional rider was about 32% of our sample. Now, our sample wasn't perfect. Our sample was skewed more heavily towards males, more heavily towards experts. But we saw that about a third of the people that did our survey were positional. They are more likely to post pictures of bold lines on social media rather than, I just skied a 10 degree slope with my kid, all right? <laughs> they think that riding bold lines will generate respect from their friends. So this is getting towards some of the motivations about what they're doing, all right? They admire riders who ski bold lines and they talk to friends about skiing bold lines, not so much about the mellow lines, all right? So this speaks a little bit about what we're proud of and what our culture is telling us about what we're doing. But does this influence our risk, all right? So there are days where you can ski bold lines, right? When the snowpack is the right condition and you're with the right group and the forecast is right and you've done your local checks, there are days where you can get away with skiing some great lines, all right? So just because you skied a big line doesn't mean you are risky necessarily. So the next part was going back to our hypothetical choices. Again, this is hypothetical. So we looked at this and we gave people a few scenarios. We gave them the same weather forecast. We gave them the same conditions. And then we gave them two choices and asked them whether they would prefer to ski one or the other. And again, whether they would accept to ski one or the other. And these are two uh, images that we used to try and elucidate those issues. There we go. So fundamentally, the answer is yes, right? So people that are positional are more willing to ski a potentially risky line. So in the hypothetical situations, those that were positional chose disproportionately the steeper line or were more willing to accept to ski the steeper line. So we see this connection between hypothetical risk and the positionality status. And what we saw was that uh, of that, we saw that the probability to accept increased 29, so we saw an 8% increase that's statistically significant in this population but also that there was a function of education. And I think this is a really good message to come out of this because it says that, hey, look, we are maybe positional. We do maybe sometimes make choices that aren't rational. We're not necessarily operating like robots that are getting told, here's the forecast, here's this, all right, I'm always gonna make this choice. There are these other factors that are influencing our decision making, but that training can maybe influence that. If you are positional, you're still gonna have a higher chance of accepting to do it, but training might mitigate that further. So I think that you guys being here today, you guys having taken avalanche classes, is helping offset that sea of hands I saw of, well, yeah, maybe I am a little positional, all right? So that, that's a really, really good thing that I think we can take away from that. We've uh, published that in a little article <laughs> called, Are You Keeping Up With Jeremy Jones? That's a little bit of a play on the words because it's keeping up with the Joneses is the economic literature. Jeremy Jones will actually say is actually a really good role model of talking about all the risk that goes into the decisions he makes and how he makes them. But I think it's, a, it's just a clever way of thinking about that. So the desire to get social respect from peers seems to play a role in increased risk-taking behavior. Key limitation, hypothetical choices can only tell us so much about real behavior, all right? What you click on a survey may not be what you actually do when you're out in the backcountry. So we are gonna address that. Remember I talked about the tracks data? We have a number of people that gave us tracks and that did the survey. So then we can say whether they're positional, what choice they would have made, and then actually where they went. So piecing those three bits together, we get a really good idea about are you positional, what's your risk tolerance, and then what did you actually do in the real world? So we, we, we're trying to get to that answer as well. The outlook. The things that give respect depend on the social norms present in the peer group. Social norms and social groups change over time and for various reasons. So we as a community have a role to play in terms of saying, hey, maybe bold lines aren't the goal. Maybe we should be thinking about posting lots of really cool pictures of the decision I, I, I did. I said, I'm not gonna go up there today. In fact, I'm gonna ski here and be proud of those decisions instead of just posting the bold lines. So thinking about the social norms and social cues and what do we get rewarded for? There's one example of that. It's called the Backcountry Ascender. It's a education program that's set up for, uh, for snowmobilers where people get kind of stars and awards for doing more education 
and for talking about safe decision making. So that's maybe a way that we could slowly change those norms. The fact that you're here also suggests that you value safety. So I think that's also really, really important. So training seems to important. Reflecting on your motivations. Are you making a rational choice about what's going on? And also choosing your ski buddies, choosing your peers, thinking about who you ski with and how you seek respect from those that you're with. That's the last thing I'm going to talk about positionality. My next topic, powder arousal. <laughs> All right, so in the context of Andrea's PhD looking at sexual decision making, we started asking questions around how does excitement influence your decision making? All right, who stood at a trailhead or in a parking lot with eight inches of fresh, 3% snow, oh, no, actually 10% snow, um, <laughs> sorry, just fizzing, excited to go skiing. All right, you felt that? Do, do you think that changes your decision making if you're in the backcountry? Yes, maybe, no? Yeah, I'm seeing some yeses. All right, so I'm fortunate to have worked with a really great film stu student on this. We have the Masters of Fine Arts uh, in Natural History Filmmaking uh, at Montana State, only one of two programs in the world. And Abby Lee did a little story on this particular project. So we did a pilot project last year, and rather than listen to me, my voice is almost breaking because I've got a cold, uh, I'm going to let the video talk a little about what we did. All righty. That's a little more interesting than me talking, right? Good, all right, so um, I'm pretty much out of time here. Um, so I just want a quick poll of hands. Do you think we found a result? Is there a yes? Do people think yes or people, hands up for yes. All right, cool, that was our hypothesis. Um, we're still working through the data. Um, we think that the strength of the stimuli may not be as compelling as the other example, uh, so the difference may not be as strong as that previous study, um, but we are seeing in some groups of that population that there are some differences. So I just want to finish up and say we've got to know snow, but we also need to know ourselves and how we respond to making decisions when we're dealing with such a complex medium that changes so rapidly over space and time. So understand the snow, get your forecast, dig a snow pit, understand what's happening, and then stop and think about how you make decisions and what's influencing your decision base. Thank you. All right, we got time for one question. We got, oh, we got one back in the back. Here we go. Hello, thank you. Hey, did you have a control for the candy that was given out during the survey? <laughs> Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, we use the same Costco candy every day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was great.